are blessed to begin our program. And uh, we have a man of God who is going to lead us throughout the week. Now we will only introduce him and hand over the podium for him to continue. Our elder in was Kevin Anna, the elder of the Church of Pentecost. He is a life youth minister, certified life coach, and a counselor. He worships at the IWC he is the immediate past deputy youth director, a position he has held for many years. And by the grace of God, uh, in about two weeks ago, on the 18th, I think, uh, he brought uh, that service. He handed over to another person to take the baton. He has been very instrumental in the church since some of us were young and has been in that position recently. He's worked, He's worked as a counselor at the Pentecost, Pentecost University from 2006, 2006 to date. He's, He's a, a compassionate, compassionate, passionate, and a respected, respected voice on youth and relational matters. He has, he has also been involved in coaching, coaching counseling, communicating, communicating, and consulting for both church and shared case groups for nearly three decades. He's an author. With three books to his credits. Coming a beauty to his glory, matters of the heart, and doing dating decently. He's married to Mama Evelyn with two beautiful daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to the house of the Evelyn Anna. Let us welcome him with a round of applause. Adam, please, you can take over. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Give God praise. And I want to thank also from Cromwell and his wife, Deborah, and the team of leaders within your district, as well as all of you on the platform tonight. It's indeed an honor to be joining you live all the way from Ghana, and uh, we pray the peace of God that the path of all understanding shall be your portion in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We, we are delighted to be joining you this day as we commence this conversation. And um, tonight we are focusing on the topic that relates to young who may not yet be married. Um, we have to give today, tomorrow, and the next day to the single or the unmarried. And then thereafter, we will deal with the matters relating to the couples. So we want to welcome each one of you to this very important conversation. It is our hope and prayer that the Lord will visit us tonight, and um, we have been giving some remit to cover between Monday and uh, Wednesday. And so today we're going to look at making the most of male-to-male interactions. Male-to-male interactions. I mean, we know that from a Christian world relationships are broken between parties. Now, your theme, which is marriage, the anatomical dissection from before I say I do, which I said to us for is a, is a theme or uh, a topic fit for organization. <laughs> As a weirdo, topic weirdo, yet it's wrong. Abudin <laughs> 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 
important that like I said we appreciate that dating would not be found neither in the New Testament nor in the Old Testament so both the old and the new will not find anything like dating you won't find anything like courtship 
now, but you would find something about marriage. Much the same way you will not find anything in the New or Old Testament about Christmas. And I make the case that even though we don't find Christmas in the scriptures, we find the essence of Christmas in the scriptures. Now, the birth of Christ Jesus that we commemorate is something that has been famously described as the Christmas season or the festive season, the Yuletide season. Now, oh, let me see if I try to. Do you think this is better? Hello, is it better? Yes, we hear you. Is this better than using the earpiece? Yes, we hear you clearly. Yes. All right, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, then let me do away with it. So, so it is important that once we cannot find Christmas in the scriptures, so it is that even Easter, you know, um, Easter is not in the scriptures. You won't find it there. There's nowhere in the Bible that you find the word Easter. But you're going to read about the Eastern star and all those things in the scriptures. Um, and so we make it do with that in much the same way we will not find it. Now, when we look at the various generations, we would notice that I use their world to represent the older people's world and your world to represent that of the young men and young women's world. I want to now open it up to brothers and sisters. And you know, share wow for a and I won't so Dr. and Dr. Mrs. Portofiatro book be two worlds at war. <laughs> and, and it gives you an idea that um, generations come and generations go. Now, the two generations will be at war necessarily, but we can find peace because Jesus being the Prince of Peace can help us to bring peace between the two generations. Now, the question is this, how did our parents live their lives in the area of relationships? Anybody can share. Also, please moderate that for me. Maybe just the next five minutes. The difference is we want to see the changes that have occurred between the older generation and the younger generation in the context of relationships. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, those days, when I uh, compare it to our generation, there were a lot of arranged marriages. Okay. What do you think accounted for the arranged marriages? The family systems were more um, involved. Okay. So a lot of the decisions were at the family level. And in some cases, the individual didn't even have a role to play. All right. Okay. Any more? I would say it was like non-existent. It was non-existent. That's fantastic observation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, any other? Any other? Okay, let's bring it to our world today. I mean, what's happening in our world? Which never happened in the in the days of our older folks. Uh, Premarital uh, marital sex is very, very common, uh, even though... Mm -hmm. All right, okay. What may be accounting for the premarital sex activities that occurs in recent times? Uh, Hollywood has a big part to play in that. Um, yeah, you got it. Easy. Hollywood, Broadway, and to some extent, Silicon Valley now. <laughs> All right, any other? Another 
people get married without their parents' consent, and that won't yeah. happen at the only. A lot of that is also occurring on the blind side of parents or without the contributions of parents. Okay. And people stay stay single for a longer period of time than previous. I don't you know have a lot of cohabitation that. going on. A lot of cohabitation, yeah. You know, living um, girlfriends and boyfriends is also contributing. So you will notice that the context has changed drastically. And this context is also affecting people of faith. And that is why we want to address this subject. So a guy meets a lady, makes a statement to the lady, for instance, what you see on the screen. I think you're really neat and I would like to get to know you better. Okay. Now, this sparks off interactions. Now, these interactions may be in different forms. The lady will respond yes or no, or um, would embrace it or reject it. It all depends on the, the state of mind or the expectations or the um, roadmap that the lady or gentleman has for his or her life. Now, this starts a whole process, which I often refer to as between high and I do. Now, high is exchange of pleasantries, connection, a greeting, some kind of, you know, something that brings you together. It could be sports, it could be worship program, it could be just bumping into each other, it could be an educational setting, it could be within the community or neighborhood. Just the exchange of pleasantries between people is what sparks a whole myriad of activities that could lead to the state where they would start saying to each other at a point that I do. Now, some take time to say I do. Others are in a vulgar haste to say I do. It all depends on the circumstances of the, of the parties in question. Now, some also go online and they connect with people uh, today we know that life is not only visible, there is life also which is virtual, and there a lot is happening. So you would most likely encounter what I call the dating game. Um, people get into dating. Um, the, the question of what they do with dating is a major one. And I actually have a book, Doing Dating Decently, um, Sometime later, we'll make arrangements to make copies available to, to your district. Um, we are now working on the e-version of it to be available online for purchase. Now, but it's important for us as Christians to understand that these concepts of dating and courtship are not particularly Christian in their origins. That is how come publications started coming up like Christian dating, Christian courtship, because the original concepts didn't come from Christians. It came from the people of the world. Now, dating now has become a game that some people play. It's almost like a chess game. Um, it's hurting people, it's destroying lives, it's creating a whole lot of chaos in the lives of individuals. And we in the church cannot afford to do that because we've got to do our things differently and having different benchmarks and standards of our behavior and our conduct. The whole issue of courtship, courtship was also like that. And so they came things like Christian courtship or biblical courtship to try and realign people's thoughts and minds. Now, so the whole idea of biblical courtship was a response to the occurrence of courtship that was undermining Christian values and Christian conduct amongst people who said they were beloved. They were considering people as significant ones in their lives. And many of whom worked it towards marriage. Others were, never worked towards marriage. It was largely experimental. And so you notice that there's a huge attrition rate, you know, the termination points are just too many. Too many relationships just end 
abruptly, they end abruptly, and creates a lot of nightmare for people. And so you're having individuals who have gone through, I mean, various cycles of breakups and what have you. And the work I do, I supervise a lot of breakups. And I tell you, it's not a, it's not a pleasant activity to be invited into. Uh, it's a very painful one for a lot of individuals. Time is wasted. Um, exchange of valuables. Um, some have just sold their conscience and soul to individuals. Because the truth of the matter is that anytime you give your heart to another, you invariably end up giving your life to them. And if those individuals don't have the wherewithal to be able to manage the heart you have entrusted into their care, they will damage your life for, uh, I mean, for a long time to come. Now, the Bible tells us something. And from there, I derive a very important principle for um, our conversation. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 to 3, but on the screen, you have one and two. Now, the verse three talks about widow, widows, but let's just confine ourselves to one and two. It says in the Message Bible, don't be harsh or impatient with an older man. Talk to him as you would your own father. And to the younger men as your brothers. Reverently honor an older woman as you would your mother, and younger women as sisters. Now, some translations would say the latter part, sisters with absolute purity. Now, I just want to draw your attention to four different kinds of relationships that have been mentioned here. The first one, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, who was a young fellow himself, that you would encounter older men. These are males, men. And he says, those individuals, your relationship with them should be that of father and son, or a son to a father. Then there are younger men who may be in your category of age or a little younger or a little older. And these young men, you must describe and relate with them as brothers. Then he says, you would find another group of people within societal norms and space who are older women and you have to treat and relate with them as mothers. Then comes the younger ladies, and he says, treat them as sisters. Now, I like some rendition that says absolute purity. Now, that raises a very important conversation for us with respect to the whole concept of dating. There is a guy in the U.S. called Randy Pope. Randy Pope has, he runs a project called The Million Dollar Mate. The Million Dollar Mate. Now, Randy Pope says that date is divine appointment to edify. So he situates dating within the con context of appointment. And for us as Christians, it is to edify. Edify means uplift, add qualitatively, improve significantly, enrich a life, make better, not bitter. Now, one time I was going to speak at one of our churches in Ashaiman. It's a very famous community in Ghana. Um, they, are, they are known for many, many things, including the good, the bad, and the <laughs> ugly. It's a very sprawling community, huge numbers of people. And was well on our way, the Holy Spirit whispered something to him because I was going to speak to them about relationships. And there, the Holy Spirit dropped in my spirit another form of dating. You see, the first one is divine appointment to edify. The one the Holy Spirit gave me this time was debasing activities through exploitation. Both are dates, but significantly they impact us differently. 
And so for the young people that I've encountered over the period, I have seen those who are dating. And the problem is actually not with the dating. It is what they are doing in the dating. There are so many people who are actually living as husbands and wives, but they pretend to be dating. You know, if you are to live your date as a divine appointment to edify, God becomes a central part of what you do. Not only would Jesus be the center, Jesus would also be the circumference, i.e., Jesus would be the walls around which determines what comes in and what goes out. I was with Legon Interdenominational Couples at Tanakazo for a retreat, and when I mentioned to them that Jesus must be the center, it was then that Reverend Mrs. Agnes Phillips said, oh, Elder, I think that once we get Jesus at the center, we can also make him the circumference. In other words, he determines what comes in and what goes out. The lawyers call it allowances and disallowances. I think the accountants also have the same concept in accounting, where they disallow or disavow some things. Now, but the debasing activities through ex exploitation is the case where people pretend to be what they are not. And they are doing stuff that are actually taking advantage of each other. So it's very much physical, it's very much emotions, it's very much sentiments, it's very much sex, romance, and all those kinds of things. So substantively, they're actually not building a relationship. They are just exploiting each other, taking advantage of each other's vulnerability. Now, before anybody says, I do, there are some things that we've got to pay attention to. Now, the first thing that comes is that there is a person, a person you are considering for a date. So on a date is an appointment, okay? Now we have an appointment for worship. We have an appointment for lunch or dinner together. We go to a prayer meeting. We go to a church service. We go to a concert. We, it's an appointment. Basically, I'm getting to know somebody. It has nothing to do with sex. It has nothing to do with kissing. It's got nothing to do with fondling, caressing, or any of those kinds of things that you know, standard television is pushing and shoving down our throat. Now, the person who is being in, in consideration. The second one is their personality, their personality, which is how they are wired. We have different kinds of personalities. Traditionally, we know of the four types of personalities, um, the sanguine, the choleric, the phlegmatic, and the melancholy. But we know that not long ago also, there was a supine personality, which was also um, discovered. Um, and there are a lot of um, articles written on the supine uh, personality. Now, the person who actually came up with the supine personality is from North America. So there's some kind of uh, connection to where you are. Now, the supine personality from the readings shows that the person has a blend of all four and tend to be very sacrificial in their inclination. Now, the third thing is that the person's history, which has got to do with their past. And past here, I'm not just talking about relationships that they've had or things they've done or not done. No, I'm talking about their upbringing. It's very, very important. The context of growth, the exposure in life, the experiences, the things they've learned. All those things are very, very important when it comes to before you say, I do. Then finally, the person's present circumstance. Their present circumstance. Because if they are in a current state, that's when you have met them. So you have the person, their personality, their past, and their present condition. These things have implications for dating. In fact, it has, by extension, implications for marriage. It does not mean turn yourself into an FBI agent and interrogate people. <laughs> That's not what I'm suggesting. 
But what I'm saying is that the person who's sitting in front of you, who is working within your company, is not a neophyte. You know, they have had some life to live before you encountered them. So be mindful of these. Now, I have observed a number of progressions, um, so many of them. I, I make recommendations from books and stuff, but I, I like to also receive divine instruction. <laughs> and as a Pentecostal believer, I allow the Holy Spirit to guide me and lead me as I interact with people. Now, this, this is a progression I've observed. The first one is, I do admire you or admire something about you. It's a great connection between people. Admiration is key. I wrote a piece in the Pentecost fire. In the beginning, God created attraction. Attraction is not a sin. Attraction is innocent. It's a mystery how a man or a woman gets attracted to each other. It's a, it's a mystery. How it happens is, is it, I mean, it baffles people because sometimes you look at two individuals and you wonder, what did they see? And it's a mystery, you know. The second one is, I sometimes desire your company. Now, you see, you meet somebody, you admire them, and then from time to time, you wish you were together. You wish we were sitting together, having a chat over a cup of tea or cappuccino or some uh, some McDonald's or something, you know, some chill out, something cozy, just to fraternize with each other and get to familiarize yourselves again. Then I very much enjoy your conversations. And you see the trajectory is taking you to a certain point. So first is you admire something about them. Second, you desire to be with them in, a, in, in their company. Third, you very much enjoy their conversations. You can talk endlessly. You can talk hours on end. I mean, you make calls and you're on the line, talking, chit-chatting. Before I realize the time is, is gone and you've got to do some assignment or some work. Then the fourth level is I'm comfortable with your convictions. I'm comfortable with your choices. I'm comfortable with your character and your core values. Now, what I've seen is that when people get to the fourth stage, it is easy for them to begin courtship. Very, very easy. Very easy. And so you will notice that the men will say things like, I have prayerfully considered you for a spouse. Then the women may say, I would not hesitate to accept your proposition for marriage. And so you would see this happening in real life. And I have seen hundreds of this. So your proposal for a divine institution of marriage may have a trajectory. And I'm quite be so and a nipa effa dream say on you obi benya nyonko na one dia call our room and no na yebu bossy obi share nipa no obe to akuma so Na bibi fan no hono we ni jihu. Sana o bom paye, sana doera de, sana o triti nipa. All those things, those are admirable traits, quality that they have. When you have that, from time to time, you wish you were in their company. Kunyanka wotin uwan in chain, we huna ne, we huna china, mo ye live chat and all those things. Why? You want to be in their company. You didn't come on. You didn't come on also. If you do be, you know, what you say, Nipano, son of city, you know, when you know, you didn't come on, wakuma, wakuma, da form, boko, be bien, you know, and then I'm going to focus, I have butterflies in my tummy, I have chills in my spine, and a friend of mine calls it the Ush Ash generation. There's a ush ash effect, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the feelings near deep in Ghana, as they say it, you know, it's all over the place. But you have to pay attention to Nipano, Nijidi engine as so, and then your friend of convictions. Sena or Tasetas in the Norma, Adia Oye, the Ompes or Beye, Nisuni Nibine, Enna near a money year in your Oye, a friend of core values. And then a money pa, a shall say, say, oh, bear my bit to me, I can say, my bomb pie, I can radiate him, say, me musa on 
se yetimi ware na oba no so o twa na me ni mo be ka so enye enye din ma mi se me pene so se oba wa all right okay now on the other hand those who practice the basing activities through exploitation often times you see the gentlemen they court for adventure to satisfy their curiosity adventure is a agoboni enibre ade ade etumi prenipa ade edi ohu beto onipa so otumi esa now they also caught for conquest to prove their masculinity or their manhood so his ability to woo a girl helps him to make a statement that, yeah i got it i got it he pumped their fist in the sky and said, i got it i got it then he tells his friends he says yeah i'm a man i'm a man i'm a man now when they are competing they compete to feel their need for control then you find in the ladies something and this is where we have vulnerability fleshes out with each other the women want attention in order for them to feel human they want affection to feel valued and they want affirmation to feel worthy so many many guys who want to get a girl will give them these three things attention affection affirmation attention is being there when you are needed because in human behavior if you are there when i don't need you you are a nuisance you are you are a distraction but when you are there and i need you then you are a blessing that's attention then affection which is the seat of our emotions the exchanges that okay then affirmation which are positive statements that i made about you commendations praise and things that encourages you and builds you up now i want to make two good recommended readers for you now as young people i want to encourage you to do a lot of reading i mean the subject we are discussing has been widely written about and um i have a duty also to point you to other people who i believe are writing authoritatively on the subject so that it's not as if i'm the epitome of all there is the people that i can point to now steve atterburn and fred stocke wrote this one for the young men it's a whole package i mean there's every man's battle every married man's battle preparing your sons for every man's battle but this particular one is every young man's battle and it's actually a book that helps young men to strategize for victory in this real world of temptation is so so crucial i recommend it it's a magdalian book um, the converts which is written by shannon etheridge and uh, steve atterburn steve atterburn is somebody who has impacted my work with youth ministry over over a long period over 25 years of impact so i mean i can testify to how the lord has used him to impact my own life and i believe that you will be impacted if you have access to these books now you notice that the every young woman's battle focuses on guarding your mind your heart and your body in a sex saturated world you see our world is so awash like one of the brothers mentioned hollywood has defined so many things and it's still redefining it's it's not ended yet it's still ongoing but we as christians must pursue the path of uh, uprightness and righteousness so that we can we can we can do something shannon observed something in her writing she talked about three levels of existence and the fourth one being a black zone now the first one she talks about somebody gives you attention or you are attracted to someone it is stress free it doesn't produce a lot of stress it doesn't give you problems necessarily for some it does but a majority of people it doesn't induce any problem or stress now you notice that like the traffic indicator green is good to go attention and attraction 
is not a bad thing. But then it moves to affection and attachment. So people move from the green going into the yellow. And when you get into the yellow, you have to pay attention. God, this is the point where you're almost becoming like you're helpless without the individual. Because attachment occurs. You are bonded. And for you, the ladies in particular, there's a hormone called oxytocin, which is the hormone of bonding. It attaches a woman to a person, even sometimes when they don't want to be attached to them. It's the same hormone that is secreted when a mother is breastfeeding. So anytime a woman is in a romantic activity or sexual activity or breastfeeding, oxytocin is secreted in high volumes and concentrations. Now, this induces bonding between her and another party. And so sisters on the platform, you want to be careful. Now, famously, the world calls it affair, so I'll just stick to it as a fair, because that's what um, Shannon talks about. Now, people get into a state of affair. There's affair in your mind, there's affair in your heart, and there's real affair, physical. Now, I read a book by a lady by the name Heather titled um, Emotional Purity. Growing up, I read a lot about purity, physical, spiritual but I had never read about emotional purity. Keeping your emotions innocent is a very tough call. You know, like Jesus stood there and said, the prince of this world comes and he has nothing in me. If we can stand and boldly declare that we keep our emotions innocent. One affair, whether it's physical, mental, psychological, emotional, can trigger a whole cycle of addictive behaviors where people live as though they can't live without another. So you hear somebody say things like, you are my world. How can a human being be your world? Isn't it amazing that when you say somebody is your world, once they leave your world, you have no world to live for. So we've got to watch that. Now, when the people go into a state where the individuals leave them, they feel abandoned. And all around us are stories of abandonment that people feel. Let's take a look at how some women can be wounded. He says, you are the first person who broke my heart. For the rest of my life, you would always be the one who hurt me the most. Don't forget that. Now look at this guy who mess up matured man. He says, don't trust too much. Don't love too much. Don't care too much. Because that too much will hurt you so much. And so there are people, and look at this young girl. A broken heart is like a broken mirror. It is better to leave it broken than hurt yourself, try fixing it. There are so many individuals who are making pronouncements out of pain. Look at this young man. I wish you would have told me from the start that you were only going to break my heart. There are people who have had this crisis. Unfortunate. But the question is, what is the root of the crisis? I've identified a few and I want to share with you. First one, poor handling of freedom. Too many young men and women, even in the church, don't understand freedom. In the book of Galatians, Paul asked the church in Galatia, shall we use our liberty for the occasion of the flesh? No. He said we're liberated, Galatians 5. But he said we shall not use our liberty for the occasion of the flesh. Our generation really does not understand liberty. We think liberty means license to do reckless deeds. The second thing is a neglect of responsibility. People are not taking personal responsibility for how they feel, for what they think, and for how they behave. They blame it on other people. If it had not been you, I would not have done this. 
you turned me on, you did this to me, as though they were helpless or they were not in control of themselves. That's number two. Number three, there is also the absence of safety and security. Too many young men and women that I have seen have not put in place the required safety guards and safety nets and securitize themselves so that they are not exposed to harm or danger. Number four, the lack of clear standards and boundaries. People build relationships and they don't have standards. They don't have boundaries. So anything goes, BBR, echo. One of the questions I asked in my book, Doing Dating Decently, is can you go out without getting in? That's the challenge. This age of all kinds of activities. What are your standards? What are the boundaries? Number five, an inaccurate view of who you are. Many young men and women that I've seen in this situation don't even know who they are. They don't know that they have been bought at a price. They don't know that they are the apple of God's eye. They don't know that they belong to the commonwealth of Israel. Once they were not a people, now they have become a people. They don't know they are in the image of God. They've lost that. So they are acting like unbelievers. They are living like Hollywood stars. They are living like yeah, movie actors. Know. They are doing their stuff like Is sports there? personalities. They are following after the pattern of the people of the world. I mean, we were born original. Let's be careful not to die duplicate, Miles Morrow would say. Then also there's the absence of a support, the support of a committed community. Many of us are left alone to ourselves and we don't have anybody who is holding us accountable and making us responsible. And we've got to go back and start the practice of be each other's keeper. We shouldn't be like Cain who has a question, am I my brother's keeper? We should be the people in Abel's life so that when the Lord asks a question, where is your brother? Where is your sister? There should be someone who can respond amongst us and say, yes. The seventh thing is what I call the absence of informed confidence. A lot of our young men and women I have seen, they have confidence, but the confidence is not well informed. I pray that those of you on this platform would have confidence that is well informed. So if you want to stay pure, you know why you are staying pure. You see, I mean, Psalm 119 from verse 9 to 11, you say, how can a young man keep his way pure? It says, by taking heed to the word of the Lord. It says, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If you look at somebody like Joseph, Joseph in the house of Potiphar had a great sense of informed confidence. To the extent that the big woman making advances and prying on you and praying upon you like a prayer mantis, he stood his ground and said, no, how can I do such a thing against God and against my master? Then he went further. He said, in this house, my master has never held anything back from me. He's given me authority over everything, but minus you. You see, you should know what you stand for, otherwise you fall for everything. It's been famously said, if you don't stand for anything, you're most likely going to fall for everything. So you should, as singles, who are seeking to get into these kinds of spaces of becoming friends with others, have an informed confidence. Your confidence must be well informed, and the informed nature of your confidence should be born out of God's word. Now, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul tells them that God desires your sanctification. The word sanctification means being set apart from something unto another. So we are set apart from wrongdoing, sinful behavior, and set apart unto God as sanctified souls. Now, then he goes further and he says that God does not only desire your sanctification, but he expects that each one of you will keep your body in holiness and in honor. Why? Because the body is the container in which God dwells, is the temple of the Most High. Now, our spirit, soul, and body 
have to be kept sound for the Lord, have to be preserved. Time gone by, God lived in temples made of hands. But he says, no longer shall I dwell in a temple made of hands. That's why he dwells in you. He lives in you. You cannot just say, he lives in me. Hmm? Who lives in you? It's the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. Who is the seal of God upon your life? So our spirit, our soul, our body, they must be staying whole unto the Lord. But in Proverbs 27 and verse 12, he says that these are principles I want to leave with you. He says, a prudent person foresees evil and hides himself. Now, the world will say that when you see something which is scary, face it. But if you're a single fellow searching for love, the first thing I want you to do is to look properly. When you look, look carefully around. Don't be in a hurry. When you are having a conversation with somebody who says they love you, listen patiently. Let the Holy Spirit grant you the discernment to know the intent of the person. And when you are listening, listen intently as well. Number three, learn passionately. You know, never ever have an encounter with somebody without learning one or two things about him or her. So you've got to keep a notebook somewhere that you write down the things you have observed. Those are very, very important observations. Number four, live your life purposely. You see, there are so many young men and women who have allowed relationships to destroy and wreck their lives because they have no purpose whatsoever. In Genesis 2, 18 to the end, it talks about God said it's not good for a man to be alone, but I'll make for him a helper suitable for him. Now, the suitability of the help is that you're doing something so they come and help you with. So my question is, what is it that you're doing as a young man, which is the one thing you forsake everything to do? The Apostle Paul said, it. he said, one thing I do is to forget the past and press on towards the high calling of God. The purpose of God for your life is non negotiable. You cannot negotiate away the purpose of God. Then also lean prayerfully. Look, prayer must be your staff on which you lean. Too many young men and women are not praying about their future. They are not praying about their marriages. They are not praying about settling down. No, no, no. no. It's as if it's a game of chance. But I pray those of you here, lean prayerfully on grace. You see, you're a product of God's grace, and therefore grace alone can hold you and sustain you. And when you choose to love someone, listen, brothers and sisters, love purely. How do you love purely? Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's the, that's the one that goes upward. But then there's a downward one, which is between us and others. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. The concept of self-love is called philosia in the Greek language. I mean, I'll address it some, on Wednesday, so I won't go too much into it. Um, and sometimes it ain't going to work. Sometimes it ain't going to take you anywhere. So you've got to walk away from those individuals. You've got to turn down their offer. And when you're living, live peacefully without ill feelings. I go online on social media and you see how people are destroying each other because somebody proposed to you, you didn't accept, and you go and damage them to your friend, damage them to everybody. The next moment, the whole church, everybody knows about it. No, you've got to leave them peacefully. Have no malice against them. Now, if you want to be a productive single, there are some things you should do. Now, never, never, ever leave these things out of your life. The first one is dignity. You need dignity for your life. What do I mean by dignity? Accept yourself and live for Christ. Carry yourself well. Number two, relevance. Find your place in your church. What is your place in the church? What role are you playing? What role can you play in the church? What giftings can you exercise in the church? Number three, service. Put the gift of grace that God has given you to work. To work. 
Esther found the kinsman redeemer when she was working. It wasn't when she was like lousy and lazy. Get going, get busy, do something. Don't stand there aloof waiting to be, to be seen, to be noticed. Get working. Number four, productive. Invest your time wisely. Too many singles don't invest their time wisely. They waste their time on frivolous things, things that are non-essentials. Number five, purpose. Dedicate your passion to a cause. If there's anything that you can do, do it now. Ecclesiastes says that whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For in the grave where you're going, there's neither planning, working, and he talks about all those things that are not there. The sixth one, passion. Share your story with other young people. Let other young people hear your story. I mean, what's happening today is that we don't hear stories. And our lives are actually built around people's stories to inspire, to encourage, to nudge us on, to, to nudge us and to prompt us. Then balance. Please, don't develop just your spirit being. Develop your social life as well. Develop your relational life. Develop your spiritual life. Develop your academic life. Develop your career life. Don't just be skewed towards spirituality and neglect all the others. Proverbs 11 one says a false balance is an abomination unto God. It's terrible to see people who are skewed on one side. If you, look, if you read Luke chapter 2, verse 52, Jesus showed how balanced he grew. We read he grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and in favor with man. It's called the quadrant of life. You know, he grew physically, he grew cognitively, mentally, sharp, wise. Then he says he had favor with God, which is divine, spiritual. Then he had favor with human beings, which is relational, social, psych, you know, social context, community sense. Contentment is the next one. The Bible tells us in First Timothy 6.6, 6, in the modern English version of the Bible, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. There's so much discontentment in this generation, but God must give us the grace to be content. I mean, there are too many people who are dissatisfied with the state in which they are as singles, and that informs why they act like couples. And you find married people also acting and living as though they were singles. May God grant each one of us the spirit of contentment. And let's make 1 Timothy 6.6 6, our slogan. Slogans are not bad as long as you stick and stay with them for positive action. And so you can keep, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I am committed and I pray that every one of you who is a single fellow on this platform between now when you say hi and the time you say I do, make sure that Jesus is the hub of your spokes. You see, so many of us, um, bicycle, bicycle, no. The wheel, no, and that dear Bishisham, and your friend spokes, no, but the spokes are connected to the hub, which is in the center of it. I pray that you make Jesus the hub of your spokes, and anything you're doing in this life, count the cost before you start it. Please count the cost, don't just be reckless and do it. Ensure that there is a balance between your heart and your head. Some of us are running with our hearts, but our head is not checking us. Others too are running with their head. Their heart is far away from it. Both are not good. Ensure you keep a good balance between the two. Please guard against complacency. Honor and respect godly values. Keep accountable friends, friends who will check you. Psalm 119, verse 63. David said, I'm a friend of all who fear you and to all who obey your commandments. So he kept good friends. Is it any wonder that Jonathan will stand with him even against his father? And finally, 
one of the things with date is this people who are dating tend to go out a lot. They go for concerts, they go for prayer meetings, they go for movie nights, they go and take popcorn, ice cream, and stuff. But anytime you leave home, return with your self respect. Never go out with your self respect and return without it. When you go out on a date, return home with your self respect. Because if you go with your self respect, and you return without it, you've lost terribly. I pray that God will give us grace and wisdom as we reflect on these things in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Osofo, for the opportunity to have shared with your singles. If anybody needs help, I recommend this guy on the screen. His name is J-E-S-U-S. He says, call upon me and I'll hear you and show you greater mighty things that you do not know. In a day of distress, we can call upon him. If you have questions, we'll take them from now. Please, if you have questions. Um, Hello. From our background in Ghana, when we were up and coming and dating, it's um, because you are taught uh, and for Kasao Kebi, or there are certain things you don't reveal to your parent until you are really certain. Mm -hmm. We are in an environment where our kids have become close to us. They they are they freely share things with us, and they are not hesitant to open up to us, depending mm -hmm. on the way we relate to them. But it has also been the fact that because in the beginning of your study, you say in the beginning of courtship, um, this couple meet at maybe church or choir practice or through these functions, and parents might not even be part of this church or might not be true Christians. Sometimes along the line when this couple introduce themselves to parents. Parents interfere and stand in the way. I think most parents are now are still hanging on to this tribalism things and all that. So how you as a Christian become certain to balance, um, take it, listen to the parent to get a blessing because we know you, you need a blessing of the parent but also standing your ground with a conviction, knowing that you have prayed and God said this is your spouse, so that at the same time you don't disobey the parent, but also you stand your ground and don't lose what you've prayed for and God has brought your way. I yeah, that's a very, very good question. Yeah, I got it. As of I hope I can be heard. Yes. They want, you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Now, thank you, Mama, for the question. Um, first and foremost, what happens is that many young people do not build friendships. They just zoom straight into dating. So you are even having situations where people are married and they are not friends. I've seen several of those. Now, normally when people build friendships which are innocent, what we call platonic friendships, their parents get to know the, their children's friends. So when it is that they are making a decision about marriage, it is the transition is very smooth. Because if your parents don't like certain friends, they will tell you straight away, I don't like this friend. This friend is some way. This friend is uh, awkward. It's, it's, a, it's a distraction. It's a bad influence. They raise all those red flags for you. And it is for you to think through and pray through and take a wise decision that will not predispose you to danger or trouble. And we know, we know it when we see it. I mean, when it, when it chuckles like a duck and walks like a duck, it's certainly going to be a duck. We've seen it all over the place, you know. The quaking will be quaking, co -co 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 -co. and you know that this one is clearly a duck. 
But sometimes we deny it. We pretend it's not a problem, but we know that deep down in our hearts is a, it's an issue we are wrestling with. Now, we need to also secondly help our young men and women to understand that parents don't mean harm. They mean well, except that sometimes they become overbearing. And sometimes some parents live their life through the children. So the children tend to rebel. And I like the book that has been written, which will be outdoor sometime next week, I think, in the US by uh, the Port Office. It's fantastic. I've known him since he was a student way back in Tama Secondary School. Um, and I know that he's one given to details and meticulous um, attention to um, the narrative. And he will do a very faithful and diligent work with respect to the meta narrative. So I will encourage each one of you to get a copy of the book because it deals with this tension between the old school and the new school. Now, we need both to survive. We need both to survive. So we need to first encourage our young people to understand that the parents should not be a threat to them. And parents should also understand that the young people should not be a threat to them. In fact, tomorrow, when I'm addressing the issue of choice, you will see an example of that. Now, I've seen young people who make such a choice, and it leads to good results or good outcomes. I've seen some too, they make such choices, and it leads to terrible, terrible, terrible outcomes. And the parents tell them, I told you so. You know, and it's, it's unfortunate if a parent would tell their child that I told you so, because what did you do to help them to avert the trouble? Because when they suffer, Collateral effect, you may suffer partially or fully as well. So when it comes to tribal issues, hmm, it's a very sore, sad reality amongst Christians. On Sunday, I was speaking about love, and I mentioned that, you know, James says that if you love God and you hate your brother, you're a liar. You don't love God. And Revelation says that the times come with people from all nations, all languages, all tribes. We will all stand before the Lord and we shout, Holy, holy is the Lamb of God that was slain. So tribal differentiations, differences, tensions have no place in a Christian's life. I always tell people, I am a de-tribalized Christian. Why do I say so? I have a big sister who is married to a, a Dangbe, but both parents of mine are Fantis. Now I have a brother who is married to a Ga, a Ga, proper Ga. One is Gandangbe, the other is Ga. Now they all together form the Gandangbe group. I have a brother who is married to a Guan from Akomufie, Akosombo side of town. I have another brother who is also married to an Enzima, okay, from the Western region of Ghana. I am married to an Ashanti. So look at us, Fanti boys and girls. And I have another sister who is married to an Achim man. Okay, look at us. Ga, Gadangbe, Achim, Guan, Ashanti, where we are Fantis. So we need to help our Christian brothers and sisters. Instead of seeing tribe, they should see the Christ who is at work in us. That will take some time. It will require advocacy. It will require all of us to put our hands on the wheel. But certainly we will get there. It's unfortunate that it is happening. But when it happens, I encourage my young men and women to be patient and talk their parents out of it. I remember I had a case where the young lady's dad told her that a quantity in our area, the young go. A long journey, marriage will not go. 
because the lady was proposed to by somebody who is from one of the West African countries. And the lady's father said, oh, I do do. <laughs> Then the lady asked her dad, but we are living in the UK now. Between Ghana and Nigeria and Ghana and UK, <laughs> which is far. <laughs> You've been able to go to UK, but you can't go to Nigeria, which is less than <laughs> an hour and a half flight. Can you imagine? But well, you can take six hour flight to Nigeria. So sometimes, sometimes we get boxed down into all these kinds of things just to excuse ourselves. But like I said, I'll give it an exhaustive attention hopefully tomorrow. Yeah, I had a... Yes, sir. This is Kojo. Okay, Kojo. Yeah, in Kansa, PI. All right, okay. Yeah, so... Uh, I want to add something to it. Um, so I remember uh, <clears throat> uh, there was a time that I uh, sent my fiancé, you know, but then I was on campus, right? So I sent my fiancé to my dad uh, the first day that he saw the girl. He didn't say anything, you know. Uh, came out to uh, shoot the girl. They had a chat. But after the girl had went, he called me back and he's like, yo, I said, dad, you know you're my son, I said, yes, dad. Um, this lady that you brought her home, um, how long have you been dating her? And you know, I told her a couple of things and it's like, oh, I, I don't want you to know with her. Uh, and I said, dad, why? And he's like, uh, he said, um, no, I just don't want you to. All right. And I went to my mom and I'm like, mom, this is what my dad is saying. And he's like, oh, he's your dad. Maybe he's seen something that you're not seeing. So what are you going to do? And I'm like, okay, so well, I'll take care of it. So I give myself three days and I pray. I pray for three days and for some reason, the feeling that I have for the girl, for some reason, dropped. Mm. Not in my mind, or was my mind playing that? But I believe in prayers and I believe in the thought of the fathers. So mm. I challenge my dad. So um, that time also passed. Then my wife got married. To, uh, also introduced her to my dad and. He was happy, you know, he was so happy about it. And so fast forward, we got married. Two years after, mm -hmm. my previous girlfriend, I first introduced her to my dad. We once met, I was talking to her, like, well, how is life? It's been a while. So how is life? It hasn't been easy. Um, you know, I got married. You know, when we, we, we went our separate words, I got married and... The guy divorced me and also got married just the other time. His second husband. And I'm like, wow, two husbands. So it means it's probably it's not coming from the man's side. Maybe it's your fault because two different kind of people and all of them just walk away. So, you know, I would say that sometimes when it happens that way, we should pray because uh, as believers, that's the only thing that when we find ourselves in that crossroad, that's the only thing, prayers. And let's listen to what God will tell. Let's see forward the sign that God will show for us. So when we find ourselves in that uh, in that uh, in that situation, we shouldn't you know begrudge our parents or we shouldn't think that hey, it's me. You know, I'm in love with a girl. Yes, it's there. And and this choice is, is forever. It's eternal. So you gotta be careful. That, you know, you add prayers. You should be the core of it. So that's what I'm saying. Thank you so much for sharing this very practical personal. You notice that I mentioned that if people have objections from parents, they should be able to persuade them. If that doesn't work, there's a likelihood God is at work. 
In Proverbs 3, 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Now, we need people to learn that so that they can trust in the Lord. Now, the Bible tells us further that the heart of a king is in the hands of God. You see, many people are in a hurry to prove a point with the choices they are making. And so I normally tell my, my clients who come to me that are faced with this situation. Parental objection is not always an objection. Sometimes it is saving you from some disaster waiting to happen. That is why you need to trust in the Lord to guide you. And whilst we educate the young people in that direction, we also have to find a way of educating parents to be considerate and allow the Spirit of God to lead them. Because some of us are bogged down into some traditional pain. You know, you had some battle which you are, is unfinished and you want your children to continue your battle for you. And that is not fair. I don't want to fight my parents' battle. I'm not supposed to. And if I, nobody is supposed to fight someone's unfinished battle, <laughs> no matter how well intended the person may be, everybody is giving weapons for his own warfare. <laughs> All right, any other question? Yes, I have a question. Please go ahead. Um, Victoria. Yes, thank you, Elder, for your beautiful presentation you've given us. Um, my question is, how do you deal with um, traditionally, like, our, well, I don't know about everybody else, but I think traditionally our parents have a hard time talking to us about dating and even talking to us about, you know, even marriage. So how do you kind of, I don't know, get that communication from them? I don't know if that makes sense, but, like, it's, right. hard, okay. it's hard to get that conversation out. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a generational thing. <laughs> um, their parents never had that conversation with them, so they don't even know how to start. In that regard, we as young people can initiate the conversation with them. It is said that if Muhammad will not go to the mountain, the mountain will go to Muhammad. I don't know how that happens though, but I think that like the Bible says, a little child shall lead them. I mean, we the younger ones can also initiate the conversation. The only thing is that we have to know how to choose our language, how to package the content or the questions we have so that it doesn't come as an assault on them because then they become paranoid or excessively reactive, you know. So little conversations that you throw along. Hey, mom, so how did you meet that? That's a, a kind of conversation. You know, daddy, you haven't even told us how you and mommy met. What was the circumstance? Just tell us. You know, you, you, you take it very casual, relaxing. But if you go like uh, daddy, you, 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 you and mommy, uh, did you date? <laughs> you, you and mommy, did you court? <laughs> that sounds more interrogating, you see. So they, they will become a bit apprehensive in their responses. But if in a very casual, everyday where things are cozy, you throw in one question at a time, one question at a time, one question at a time, you don't overload them because nobody likes overload. I'm a gradualist. You can start the conversation from there. Or you go to a wedding with your dad or mom. And you're like, dad, do you know how they met? Dad, are you looking forward to the day I also, you know, marry like this? <laughs> you know, I mean, little, little questions. You can ask that. Are you praying about my marriage? You know, 
And they will ask you, oh, why are you asking me this? I said, oh, that, I, I look at marriages and I'm seeing things here and there. Some of them are falling apart. I want mine to work when I'm ready. They may ask you, hey, are you planning marriage? They say, oh, no, 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 I'm not planning marriage yet. <laughs> but if you are planning it, to be honest, tell them. <laughs> Yeah, if somebody has come forward, you can just go to them and have a conversation. Dad, mom, and you must go to the one that you are you easily connect with. You see, we have both parents. You you can't connect with both at the same time. It's very rare that one, but at least you may connect with one. And more often than not, it's the mothers who tend to connect, unless in an extreme case where the mother is very repulsive and rebuttal. You would you would most likely go through the route of your mom. So start having conversations with your mother, and I'm sure that when the decision is well made, she can facilitate the process of it getting to your dad as well. If there are some specific things that we can do to assist, I would I would I'll put out my contact, and uh, if anybody has need of it. We can deal with some specific guides in that area. Yeah, if you have some specific stuff, we can we can just deal with them at the individual level. Any other question, please? Praise, 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 praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Yeah, um, my question is: I think we all believe that. God instituted marriage, and the Bible should be the basics for all marriages. Mm -hmm. and I think in our days, uh, but, the, but the question is, like somebody asked, is it the problem with the church or with the parents for not going by the Bible guidelines or properly informing uh, this generation about what marriage is about? Because it seems they keep on messing up. And if we don't deal with this from today, in the coming generations, the church will be messed up totally. Because it seems the devil has taken hold of this coming generation's marriage. Because they are basing their marriage on lust. And they rather say it is love. So is it a, pro is it a problem with the church or with the parents for not using the Bible? Or don't we... Is it that we don't inform them properly about what marriage is about? We don't teach them or we don't preach about marriage consti consistently in the church? Is the question clear? All right. Yeah, it is very clear. Thank you for your question. But well, I think it's a myriad of issues. It's a myriad of issues. For instance, look at parents. Some parents themselves are struggling with their marriage. So that casts a certain picture for the young people, you know. So the example of the parents is crucial. The adults in the church is critical. Just think about it. Look at an adult in the church who is going after a 20-year-old girl who is single. Meanwhile, he's married. What image or impression is he creating about marriage? He's trying to convey and communicate to the young lady that marriage doesn't work. You see? So we need people who are married to live and behave like married people so that they're a good example. Because the good example will inspire confidence in the next generation. They will have an example to look up to or point to and say, this is a good example I want to follow. The second thing is, as for the church, it is doing what it can do. But we know that marriage is by the individuals and by extension, their families. Unfortunately, many people will follow you to the altar. But once you are done with the altar, that's the end. They will not support you when you're going through crisis, when you're going through difficulties. Other people too, they are not making investment in their marriage. They think the fact that I'm married to you means things will work out. 
That's, that's real danger to have. So there's a need for us to help those young men and young women who are also married to understand that marriage, yes, you have entered the matrimonial union, that there is a lot to learn still. I mean, I'm not so old in marriage. I'm only 20 years in marriage. But we run a couple's retreat. We've been running it for five years. The oldest couple who are part of it, they have been married 31 years. And yet they come for a retreat. Why? Even though we are younger than them. So I believe that people who are young can also be good examples. And that's what I would say to this matter. The floor is still open. Also, let me add this. You see, for instance, if somebody is an accountant, they read all the accountancy books. But how many are reading books on marriage? Mm. How many are reading books on how to be a good father, a good husband, a good wife? Not many few. I mean, uh, I mean, very many few are doing that, you know. Not many are doing it. Why? Because some of us don't find the need to do so. And my friend, Dr. Emmanuel Hobson, says that many of us will be sacked from our workplace if the way we handle our marriage, we took that to the workplace. <laughs> we would have lost our job one minute. Because in the job place, they would, in the workplace, they will not countenance that behavior. They will not. So if you are reading accountancy books, pharmacy books, medical books, nursing books, and what have you, find time to also read marriage books. I have a question. Hi, hi. All right, please go ahead. Um, so I've noticed something that in our community as Ghanaians, well, as Africans really, that um, when you get to a certain age, it kind of just seems like, and you're not like dating or married or anything like that. Everybody just kind of want to ask you, or is your boyfriend or just the pressure of getting like a boyfriend or something like that? How do you deal with that pressure and not rush into like a relationship and then mess it up? That's fantastic. That. That's fantastic. I always say that relationships, they are important, but they are not an emergency. Mm -hmm. It's important to relate with people, not necessarily as boyfriend or girlfriend, but to relate with them as human beings, okay? So when I relate with you as a human being, the outcome of it may be varied. Now, it's unfortunate that some people arrogate to themselves the right to be asking people, when are you going to marry? When are you going to have a child? When are you, you know? And I want each one of us to understand that pressure is everywhere. I'll give you my own pressure that I experienced. When I was not married, people asked me the questions. When I got married, they were, hey, I'm looking for my grandchild. People were saying it. When we had our first daughter, somebody asked me, hey, when is the second one coming? <laughs> when the second one came and she was a girl, People are asking me, when is the boy coming? <laughs> you know, so I had to ask myself, what is it that I'm looking for? My wife and I had agreed that we have two children and then God bless us with two daughters. Okay. And we are very, very content with the two daughters. We are satisfied with that. And that's what God has given us. In fact, one elderly fellow, I, I, I pleaded with him, Chief, I beg you, this should be the last time you're asking me this question. The next time you ask me, it won't be nice. And that's how he stopped. Some people have developed a new ministry of asking people, when are you, when are you getting married? When are you getting married? They are all over the place. And it is causing disaffection in people in church. And it's high time they stop that because it's not a ministry gift. 
So I don't ask people when I get married, uh, do you have a child or you, know, you don't have a child? I don't ask those questions because it gives people all kinds of concerns. Recently, a friend of mine I've known for close to five years. I didn't even know it. He didn't have a child. <laughs> it's just I was in a meeting and somebody was talking and they mentioned him. I was like, wow. So this friend of mine doesn't have a child because I hardly see him post a picture of him and a child or him and his family. But I know people have those decisions to make where they don't do that unless they are at a certain age. So I, I wouldn't go to use that as a basis to know whether they have a child or they didn't have. But it turned out that that's the situation. You know, I've known him for long. So I, I, I plead with every one of us, let us be mindful of that. Uh, <laughs> when are you getting married? The, the term spiritual gift. <laughs> oh, well, let's tell them that it's not a spiritual gift. Some people create the impression that when you marry, your life is full. But I've seen people who are married and their life is half. <laughs> so let's not make a monster of it. Hallelujah. Amen. With regard to the courtship and marriage, as some mm -hmm. of them asked, uh, is it good to be reading something like that in the Bible or to follow some books that people have written? I'm not saying written books are no good. Well, we see Joseph marrying Mary. We saw that according to their culture, they were like courting even though there's no word like courtship or dating mm -hmm. in the Bible. And we saw, uh, I think, Jacob also getting to marry Rebecca. He followed the same way of maybe courting or... Uh, and Samson also made a choice. Yeah. So I think um, the question is, is it good to inform all of us? Because marriage is not about this generation or the next generation, all of us. Is it good to be reading the Bible stories to continually inform us to know and practice it than to be basing on written books? Because if a white man writes a book, they will follow their way or the system of their way of life. Whereas maybe they can go to the seashore for walking with nothing, but According to my culture, I don't go there like that. So that is the question. So we try to inform us to continually be reading the Bible stories. Because the Bible, I know, has some mystical power or divine power than other books that we can read. Okay, one brother said that if you write out your sermon, it is not spirit-filled. In this day and age, <laughs> now, if you have encountered our former chairman, Apostle Professor, mm -hmm. I have worked with him as my rector and as my patron before he became my chairman. <laughs> he writes, he writes, he writes, and yet he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at the songs that the Lord gave. Uh, drunk, various people from uh, the one that came, the God of our fathers that God today. Yeah. All through to the very last one. So, I want to encourage you of us. When you read a book, what you do is you contextualize. You put it in the book. The fact of it being a book which is not like the Bible, does not mean you should not read and take it seriously. Otherwise, then we should not go to school. <laughs> we go to school to read books, to learn from professors who don't have any godly instinct in them. And yet, for academic purposes, we read, write our exam, and exit. I said, bingo. So I want us to take time. I've had a lot of some, I go to meetings, one elder will stand up and say, me and my wife, I didn't know her from anywhere, we don't marry her. Well, there's a new dynamics right now. And you must be very careful. Because 
you may not have gone to uni for a very long time. You may not have done your master's. You may not have done your PhD. So maybe you finished school very early and started work, 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 work all through. Now your son or daughter can go to third degree, second degree, maybe, maybe a PhD. Chances are that their life will turn out very different. So there's a need for us to have children. When you look through the Bible, there's not just one model of marriage. And that the volume is faint again. Oh, sorry. I was saying that there's not just a single model for marriage in the Bible. There are several models of marriage in the Bible. When I when I share by God's grace with Jesus Tarius, we'll touch on those things about choices. Hello. Yes. Hello. Um, Yay, hi. Thank you, Elder, for this opportunity. Um, oh, bless you. I would like to find out how age differences and educational background affect relationships or um, play a role in marriage. Thank okay. you. You see, I... Growing up, I saw a professor who got married to somebody who has never been to a classroom before. And they had a very good, beautiful marriage up to today. But what he has done is to organize um, home classes for the wife. And the wife now has a diploma. He's a professor, but his wife now has a diploma. You see, he married her stuck illiterate. But she was a good woman, a godly woman, who could be a helpmate. So he married her. But he didn't leave her at that level he found her. He's brought her to a level which is appreciable for her to read and write. Because she's a good woman, a godly woman at that, and can take care of him and his children. You see, um, some have made a monster of that whole issue of relationship or backgrounds or academic or job or whatever. No matter what happens, whoever you marry, it has implications. Because it is said choices have consequences. Whatever choice you make, it comes to consequences. So if you marry someone who is huge, very intimidating, now chances are that when he roars, or when he screams, you have to go and hide in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> I know of a, a case where the lady married a guy who is six pack. He's six foot and I think five inches. <laughs> and this lady is very small. It's very, very small. I mean, smaller than I am. And when the guy gets up, he says, me, me, boom, bow. <laughs> when the guy is upset, he doesn't beat her. He doesn't do. I mean, let me just say that hitting your wife or husband is not part of love. Okay. But this guy will hold the collarbone of the wife and shake it, shake it, shake it. Okay. <laughs> That's worse than a nightmare. And the, the story went that one day when the guy shook the lady, the lady student said, oh, cool, cool. And then the lady, oh, so crying in a free moose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. 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 So generally they say, buyer beware. Whatever person you marry, it can impact you. And age difference, you see, some people have a certain notion. They say age is a number. I beg you, don't, don't ever buy into that. Age is not a number. Age has effect on your body. <laughs> age impacts your body. <laughs> if you live and you say age is just a number, then you yourself, you don't know what you are saying. Age is not just a number. It has impact on you. As you grow, your body begins to talk to you. Mm. Yeah.
You see? And you can't ignore it. <laughs> and when you look at the age differences, you notice that even sexual activity and all that between spouses, age is a critical component of it. Because there are people who are having ill health, they're having challenges, they are on pressure medications and what have you. I'm not saying young people cannot be on pressure medication, but compared to an elderly person who is on pressure medication, who is more predisposed to potential trouble, is the older one. So we need to get people to understand that. Don't just say age is a number. Age is a reality that impacts your body when it does impact your body. All right. Um, thank you so much. Mm. Um, I know we have a lot of questions. We will be here for the entire week. I would respectfully ask that we put down your questions. Uh, you can ask them tomorrow. Uh, those of us who don't know, the time in Ghana now is 2 a.m. <laughs> and I don't have to talk in a lot, so I would want us to respect the time. So we <laughs> can also get some right. Maybe so, I can take one last question. Okay, and I say he will take one last question, and after that, we can um, draw the curtains tonight. Any question? Well, I must say that I've enjoyed the interactions. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and hopefully, God willing, if Jesus tarries, we'll connect tomorrow. Thank you. But those of you who picked my contact, you can send your WhatsApp questions to me as well so that I can look at them. Or you can send them through Pastor, and Pastor will forward them to me. God bless you too. God bless you Amen. so much.